In this video, we're gonna be covering some major news happening in the NFT markets, as well as some up and coming projects you've got to keep an eye out for. And by the way, if you want the latest alpha on what's going on in NFTs, make sure to follow me on Twitter. All right guys, so the first project that we are gonna be covering is going to be Moonbirds. Now, as you know, in my previous video, we talked about it before they actually minted, but let's go ahead and do a little analysis on the project now that you know it's pretty much going crazy into the moon, right? quite literally. Now, just to recap what Moonbirds is, it's PFP project by Proof Collective and Proof Collective already has almost a hundred ETH floor. And essentially it's like this group of like VC kind of people who invest in like startups and like NFTs and cryptocurrencies and them kind of put together. And it's a group by Kevin Rose, as well as True Ventures, which is a multi-billion dollar VC fund that have been doing it for a long time now, right? So Moonburst is basically their PFP profile, which is really interesting because it's the first time a venture capital fund is launching their own PFP. So this is quite a new concept. And because, you know, this is already a well-established fund, a lot of people are FOMOing into Moonbirds because they think it's gonna be the next thing, right? Now, the floor price of Moonbirds right now is gonna be 20.9 ETH, which is ridiculous because when it first came out on the secondary market, it was about eight Ethereum. So we're gonna use IC tools to kind of give you a breakdown of how this all went down. When it first came out, people minted it and whatever, and then it's on the secondary market, people were buying it for like eight Ethereum on the cheap level, and then six Ethereum over here. Here. So a lot of people got in, probably bots and stuff like that, got it for, oh my God, two, 2.5 and six, that's ridiculous. But you know, most of the time they're getting from six to eight, right? And obviously people are gonna buy the rare one. So that's why there's a bunch up here. And then the volume just kept going crazier and crazier and crazier. Like if we're looking at volume, tens of thousands of Ethereum has went into this project. Obviously the volume is slowing down. So that could potentially mean that the floor price is gonna start dropping because you can see a steady decline in the volume. Obviously there's gonna be less sales per day. So obviously, you know, if you're a trader, usually you want to buy and sell within volume. So like for example, example, if you were to trade this project and you saw you're thinking like, oh my God, there's gonna be a lot of volume, then you'd probably buy around like six to eight ETH and then see where it goes depending on the volume. And right now it's at a 20 Ethereum floor. So it's pretty crazy. And if we want to compare it to, let's say like, okay, so right now there's 63,000 Ethereum volume traded, but like, what does that really mean? Right? So if we look at, for example, CyberKongs, which is Genesis combined with babies, the total volume for the entire project since the birth of its existence for one year has been 54,000. And so Moonbirds, if you think about it, has more volume than CyberKongs have their entire first year of being in business in like three days, similar to Kaiju King's. Kaiju King has 26,000 volume traded, which is pretty ridiculous to have 63,000. And so obviously the more volume that goes into a project, the more volatility there is and the higher chance that it can like completely moon, right? And so that's why most traders are trading on volume because it's a lot easier to make money that way. So you could say that Moonbirds is the most successful when it comes to having as much volume in a short amount of time. Like it's really unheard of to have like a 2D pixel profile project have, you know, this kind of volume. So maybe this will spark another wave and people getting into 2D PFPs possibly. Hopefully that rolls into other projects. And you know, one of the other things that is really interesting that I've been noticing people talking about Twitter is like, where is all this money coming from, right? Are people selling their blue chip projects and whatever so they can buy Moonbirds, for example? Or is this money coming from, let's say like people who invest in like crypto uh, alternative coins and they're moving it into an NFT for the first time, for example? You know, I'm not really sure exactly, you know, I wish I knew where that volume was coming from, but if it's coming from outside of NFTs, that would be excellent because as people, you know, take profits and they roll it into other NFT projects, that would be great for the whole ecosystem. Or maybe people are just selling their, you know, blue chip NFTs and rolling it into blue Moonbirds, right? I'm not sure if there's like an easy way to know. If you know, please let me know in the comments, but we're, it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen to the NFT markets, you know, after this, like all this volume has moved into Moonbirds. And by the way, if you want the most updated alpha, especially when it comes to Moonbirds and other super hype projects, make sure to join the Parallax Discord. Usually I don't really sell the community too much over here, but essentially for the Parallax Discord, a lot of people have been sharing a lot of alpha when it comes to trading, buying and selling. And we have secretly been giving away some really special whitelist opportunities in there. Some of the whitelist opportunities that I've given so far in this community are Nanopaths Phase 2, Project PXN, NFT Keys, Imaginary Ones, all within the Parallax Discord. And best of all, right now, it's free to join. So I don't ask for anything. There's no NFT. There's no subscription. It's literally free to join. If you want to check it out and get involved in the community because we're building something special there, uh, make sure to check out the Discord. And speaking of whitelist opportunities, we're gonna move into the next project for this video, and that is going to be Ivy Boys. Now, in all transparency, Ivy Boys did reach out to me and offer my community and myself some whitelist opportunities, and also whitelist opportunities for you if you are in the Parallax Discord, but I will be giving my honest opinions about the project.
product. Diving right into it, we are going to go into the Ivy Boys Twitter. And as you can see, the company that is basically creating the ecosystem which Ivy Boys live in is going to be BBRC, right? And so if you're looking for this project on Twitter, just find BBRC. First thing we got to start off with is the art, right? Because art is the thing that catches the eye. It's the first thing you see when you look at an NFT. Now, basically for Ivy Boys, they're going for this like smart, business casual kind of look and I'll explain more on why they chose this direction but overall you know I would say it's pretty clean I can see it working in the NFT space you see these giveaways like people are going crazy for it there's a lot of retweets what a lot of likes and stuff so it may not be everybody's taste but if you're into like men's fashion you like that smart sophisticated look I mean even this guy's wearing like some joggers and some vans right so you know it's it's a different kind of looks but if you're into fashion and that kind of stuff hey it could be for you another thing I'll say about the art is it's actually I feel like it's taking some inspiration from this Belgian comic called Tintin it's this little character over here I'm not super familiar with this uh, cartoon right but it was created in 1929 so a long time ago as a similar style when we look at Ivy Boys right you put it side by side it's not exactly the same right they're definitely doing the, it their own way but I definitely see the similarities now the reason why for the art looking like this is because one of the founders comes from this background and so let me explain what that means now the founder of this project is going to be Nelson Yap and he has been doing entrepreneurship and has business experience uh, for over 10 years and he's been quite successful within the fashion industry the luxury industry as you can see he's fully doxxed you see his face and he seems like he's a handsome, stylish kind of guy, honestly. So one of the companies that Nelson operates at a large level before he started doing NFTs is going to be Benjamin Barker. And as you can see, it does follow a similar style to Ivy Boys where it's like this smart, casual kind of look. And honestly, it looks pretty good. So they're gonna have the button ups, obviously. They're gonna have like these, you know, essential, like crew necks, oversized kind of hoodies, like luxury essentials. Got the pants, chino pants, got the face mask. Uh, probably has some tailored clothes as well. Yep, tailoring right here. So they have a lot of different looks when it comes to that smart look you know Nelson is an entrepreneur he's grown many different brands and stores around the world especially when it comes to menswear and luxury um, he has stores in Singapore Southeast Asia Melbourne and is expanding into LA so this is somebody that actually has business operational experience on an international level right and the artist is going to be Aaron Chang and looks like he's been doing art for a while and he's been doing this kind of like uh, minimal menswear kind of fashion stuff for quite a bit, right? He's been pretty consistent when it comes to posting content on his Instagram. And also he's not just a random artist, but he also collaborated with celebrities like Tyler, the creator, worked with major brands like New Balance. So he's definitely someone that has been in, in the game for quite some time. Okay, so, so far we have some pretty strong art that hits a certain niche, has already worked in the past before. So I believe people are gonna like it. Number two, we have an entrepreneur that has operational experience successfully over the last 10 years, which is a big plus for me but now the question is okay it looks cool entrepreneur is cool but like what is the utility right and as you know Nelson has been in the menswear game for quite a long time so you can bet that Ivy Boys is probably going to have some kind of tie into menswear whether that's creating some kind of merchandise clothing special access to special events possibly relating to this entire lifestyle but the way I see it is like Ivy Boys is almost like a lifestyle brand intellectual property that connects you to this kind of world right? and it's gonna be for people typically that like luxury goods menswear who like to look smart and sharp I feel like as long as they built that community of those people who are kind of like-minded or believe in that kind of aesthetic, they can pretty much create any type of utility because if you have that lifestyle, lifestyle can blend into so many different things, different products, different type of experiences. So I'm looking forward to what they have to offer. And BBRC, what they're trying to do with that is they're trying to build this community of creators and builders and really take like these artists, similar to like Aaron, for example, and create brands out of it. And so you probably will see more different projects coming out of BBRC, uh, similar to Ivy Boys, and Ivy Boys is just one of their brands. And you know, I'm looking forward to see what they put out in the future. And hopefully as I watch them, honestly, like I hope they don't totally dilute out their brand and create project after project. And I really do hope that each project has a lot of quality, effort, and thought put into it. Now, real quick, we're going to be talking about some drama when it comes to this project Possessed. Now, I've seen a lot of people pretty excited for this. The art is pretty interesting. You know, there's not much of a roadmap. If you go on their website, it's kind of like, you know, everything to be determined. So it's like, okay, cool. It makes it kind of feel like a designer project based on what they communicate to the world. But the drama that I actually wanted to cover is that Clerk Clerk, which is somebody I follow he's a cyber con he basically has a project called scholars and scholars you know they're doing their own thing and sometimes they give whitelist opportunities to their holders and it looks like project leads at possessed offered clerk clerk some whitelist opportunities and then clerk clerk you know in exchange said okay cool i'll give it to my community and i'll introduce you to carfru and carfru is one of the biggest nft projects in asia but what happened is after 
Clerk Clerk make that uh, introduction. Possessed didn't want to offer them whitelist opportunities and just made it an excuse. And it's kind of like, that's really weird. Like, why not just give it to them, right? And so in the end, what happened is Jejo was like, hey, you know, thanks for offering the whitelist spots, but we take it back because you didn't do right by Clerk Clerk. And it, obviously this is just drama and I'm not trying to be a gossip channel or anything, but it's really interesting to see that how people behave behind closed doors kind of is a reflection of how they will probably run their company and treat their employees and their community. And if you promise someone something and you don't do it, it's basically the same as lying or pulling a rug in a sense, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. So when it comes to this project, you know, it's like they have really good art, right? And I understand like I did a little research on the founders and stuff like that. And they come from a design background. So obviously the branding is going to be on point. But when it comes to the Web2 application, there really isn't anything to it. When it goes, when you go into the FAQ, it's pretty much all promises. Like we'll figure it out once we mint. But yeah, you know, something to put on your radar if you're interested or maybe not up to you. All right. So the next project that we are going to be talking about is going to be in the gaming space, because I believe gaming is going to be one of the biggest industries when it comes to NFTs. And we're gonna be talking about Ninetales. Now, Ninetales did give us whitelist opportunities for me and my community. But again, I'm always gonna give my honest opinions. And if you want those opportunities, make sure to join my Discord to enter the giveaways. So for Ninetales, essentially, it is a card game that is similar to, let's say, like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon trading card games. But actually, it looks kind of similar to Dota Artifact, which wasn't a very successful game. But I definitely see some similarities they're pulling from here. And I'll explain it in a second. So right off the riff, you know, Ninetales, they have some interesting art. Uh, obviously, they're really trying to build like an actual IP similar to let's say like Hearthstone is, but doing it their own way. They got dragons, orcs, uh, elves, robots, and things like that. So as you can see, it's going to be a card games, uh, online playing card games. Uh, they're going to have NFTs with it. And the first thing I want to start off with is the team. So obviously, if you kind of go on the website, there's going to be a large team of people working on this. So it seems like the, the core founders are going to be four founders. Art, one artist is from Ubisoft, which is a triple A development studio. One is a game designer who is really good at magic, I guess, magic, the gathering and poker. PhD the research who has made tokenomics blockchain engineer so they have different diverse experience and this project is also advised by frederick who is the ceo of tag hewer which is a large company and that's going to be a really big deal because that directly ties into lvmh because his father is actually the ceo of lvmh which is a huge company and they own louis vuitton hermes dior and the list goes on and on and on right and obviously to have this kind of person on your board is a big deal because it's a big stamp of approval they also have project Gojira over here as well so they definitely probably have an advantage when it comes to understanding the cryptocurrency side and getting people excited especially when it comes to twitter so a lot of boxes are being checked in this front so let's go ahead and look at the combat system as you can see it's similar to dota artifact or magic gathering or you know you can compare it to anything actually but you know they're definitely doing it their own thing and trying to innovate in a sense so how it kind of works is like instead of having one board there's like two boards in one so you know this side fights this side this side fights this side uh, i don't know exactly the exact game mechanics i didn't read like the whole instruction manual but there's going to be four sub zones where your characters can fight and right now there's actually the genesis nft available there's only going to be 515 of them so it's not not that many. Uh, the floor price has been increasing quite a bit over the last few weeks, where just like a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago, it was like 0.05 and now it's 10x to like 0.6. So obviously they're really doing that marketing push and they're getting people excited about this project, which is very good in terms of a marketing front and generating that hype. And they're also going to be launching another phase of their project after the Genesis. Now, if you want the Genesis, there's going to be benefits of holding that. You know, you can like earn rewards and like uh, you have advantages when the game comes out, you can buy certain things for cheaper, right? And so there are definitely advantages to doing that. That. And the most interesting part about this is the play to earn mechanic. Right? When we think about play to earn games, like Cyber Kong, for example, has a play to earn game. Uh, there's there's like pros and cons of it. Or like Axie Infinity, for example, a lot of times like you know bots can like ruin the game, for example, in Axie Infinity. Or maybe it feels like you have to pay to win, and that's not really fun for people who are starting out because it's like you don't want to pay so much money to play the game uh, because it's a game, right? It doesn't make sense to pay like ten thousand dollars just to play a game. That's not that fun. So what they're trying to do a little differently. Well, number one, they're trying to encourage encourage people to not just take out the money that they earn in the game and turn it into like Ethereum or US dollars, but actually reinvest it back into the game. So they're creating certain mechanics for that. And also uh, what they're doing is they're introducing this game mode called the Coliseum. So like in a card game, you know, whoever has the best cards is going to win, right? It's so like if you, I used to play Magic the Gathering when I was in elementary school and it's like the kids that have a lot more money or the parents had a lot more money than my parents did, they would have all these like crazy rare cards and like it's very hard to compete against that, right? And so I think they're trying to stray away from that and make it so that it's not a whale game by introducing this mode where you know you have a pool of players everybody has their own deck and then everybody mixes their cards together in a pool and then one by one you pick the card that you want and you create your own deck using everybody's cards so that if you're a beginner you get to play with 
everybody's cards, right? And then you can actually win in this tournament or Coliseum without having to pay a lot of money to do that, right? And I guess in a way it disincentivizes the people who are at the top. They're like, why would I pay so much money for these rare cards when, you know, I have to share it with everybody else? That is another problem that we will see if they can figure it out. But the thing I really respect is that they're trying to find ways to figure it out, right? Nobody has the answers, you know, in Web3 and crypto gaming, like we're literally just inventing it as it goes. So I can always respect somebody that gives it an honest try to try something new. So if you're interested in Nine Tails and you want to be involved in, let's say, getting into phase one, which is their new NFT drop coming out, make sure to follow them on Twitter, join their Discord and get a little active, right? And if you want a whitelist opportunity for that, make sure to join the Parallax Discord as well, because we're going to be doing that very soon. And so that said, that's it for this video. I will see you guys in the next one.